Hey, everybody. Welcome to a very special edition of Gwent Talk. Today, uh, I'll be your host. I'm Shinmiri. I'm filling in for Apero, who is on her honeymoon right now. And we have uh, LB Dutch Boy as my co-host today. How are you doing, Dutch Boy? Doing pretty good, man. How are you? Great, great. Can't wait to talk to our guest today. So today, we're, we're celebrating Eratusa's one-year anniversary. Woo. Can't believe it's been one year already. Yeah, woo! And we have uh, our two very special guests are Heno and Demorcus, the two co-admins of the team. How are you doing, Heno? We'll be talking with Heno first today. Thank you. Hey, um, hey, hey, Shin. Hey, hey, Dutch boy. I'm doing fine. Uh, yeah, happy to be here. And uh, I'm uh, curious what you have in store for me today. Yeah, so um, for, those of, for those of you viewers who aren't familiar with our format, we uh, talk with one guest uh, separately first, then we talk with the second guest, and then together after that, we get together and have a group discussion and answer some of your burning questions. And uh, during the show today, feel free to uh, tag Team Eratusa in the chat with some questions, and Mark Theus, the wizard behind the curtains there, will be taking some questions from the chat to an uh, for us to answer at the end of the show. So make sure you guys get on that. So, Heno. Happy one year anniversary to Eratusa. Thanks, Shimmy. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? It's already been one year. Feels no, like I, fantastic. you know, we never knew that what we were in store for, right? Like we never expected a, we never expected yeah. anything of it at start. And now we're one year here. We have a website and we have two people playing in Challenger uh, next month. Oh, that's so. crazy. That's crazy. So um, you were one of the original team, right? So tell us a little bit about um, Eratusa's origin story and how it was created. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think the origin story starts with me a bit. Um, I, I played Gwent, I think, in March of closed beta. So I think it was like two months before we were in open beta. And at that point, um, you know, I played it casually. I liked the game and uh, I was a Yu-Gi-Oh player uh, when I was younger, right? Like when I, when I was in my teens. So I, was, I liked Gwent because it had similarities with Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, yeah, I... I played it, I think I hit rank 13 in close beta, which was kind of like uh, rank 20 is now, right? Like everyone who's pit. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every, everyone who's, uh, you know, if you're if you're above average or average, you know, you make that. And after that, it's like the hard climb. Um, yeah, I went for that. And after open beta released, I started playing more. Uh, I got interested in playing tournaments. So I played Gwentleman's Open July back then. Um, and actually, uh, you know, like the prepare, the preparing for that was pretty rough, right? Because I had no clue what was good and what was not. Uh, you know, right. like I played, I played a bit of X Men, then like everyone was, and <laughs> just consume like everyone was. But you know, he didn't really know what was good. So um, I actually did really well, I guess. I I made it uh, day one. I made it through there, and I made it to top eight, uh, which you know, for my first tournament, it went was really good. Uh, but I noticed that I had kind of a disadvantage as I didn't really know what was good or not. Uh, so in that sense, you know, I started searching for other people, you know, to talk with, to kind of, uh, you know, prepare with for this stuff. Um, and that led me to find the Reddit, the competitive Gwent Reddit, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, uh, I guess, not frequently visited anymore nowadays. No, I don't think so. But yeah, it really is I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I've been yeah. there too. And actually, um, I found someone on there, uh, Des, he was a Belgian player. Um, we got along and we decided to found like, um, to make like our own practice group. You know, he had like the, si the same problem as me that he couldn't find, you know, good players to <clears throat> practice with. Uh, so there we started a group. We invited some players we knew. Actually, one of the first players um, that I invited was Kafna. I played him in a tournament and, you know, uh, eventually he he was he's now the guy who made our website so <laughs> it's pretty funny how that goes uh, i know that's huge cockna best dev <laughs> yeah for sure um yeah and we made uh, a, actually a reddit post on the competitive gwent reddit where uh where we got pe people in from i i think shimmery you that's how joined i found as well it. yeah that's how i joined eratusa from the competitive gwent subreddit post Sick. yeah exactly <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's got, kind of how we formed. We got yeah, those so, key boys right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Eratusa was basically born from a need for, you know, discussion with competitive Gwent and tournaments and preparation and just 
talking about uh, decks and competitive Gwent in general, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and that was what it was at first, right? I think the first two months it was uh, it was just us talking and about the game a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, asking like what decks are good. Um, and I think uh, after a while we there was another Gwentman's Over tournament where uh, we did pretty well and. That was also the same weekend as uh, I found Damork is actually streaming and I invited him to the team. Um, from that point on, um, you know, he joined the team and we had like a really good weekend as like uh, as a group in the tournament. We got like four people in the top 16. And nice. we, we actually impressed Damork a bit with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was pretty funny. Like it was, it were. Oh, it was it was me and it was Kachna, right? It was like the people who are like not really uh, seen as like the great players of Team Artusa right now. But uh, at the time, you know, it was a really cool feat. And uh, the Morks was impressed. And actually, you know, he talked. He said like, yeah, I think you guys can do more. Uh, and that, so we started talking a bit more. And eventually we decided to uh, make our practice group, which uh, it was to more of a team. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds like it was born from pure passion. Yeah, that's a pretty long story, but I still want to know one thing. Why Team Arduza? Oh, Why Arduza, man? It's actually a good question. I think, um, I think some people are going to be disappointed in the story. But it, oh. was, a, it was actually uh, Des, uh, the Belgium uh, player who I found the team with, who came up with the name at the time. Um, you know, it was, it was the Witcher lore that was in it, so... You know, there was something we wanted. We wanted it to have something to do with the Witcher universe. Um, and, you know, I didn't really know m much of the universe. I'm reading the books right now. I just finished the first one, like, nice. two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting there, guys, but uh, no are <laughs> in it yet. Uh, but I didn't really know a lot of it uh, about the lore itself. And I felt like, yeah, the name's pretty cool, you know. Artusa Adept was one of my favorite cards. So I was like, yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> um, Did he tell you that it's an all-girl academy? Oh no, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Just left that detail out. I found out. Uh, I found out how true Reddit later. <laughs> oh damn! <laughs> I, I I remember a point. I think it was like three months into it, where we had a group meeting or a team meeting, and been like, "Well, should we change the name Eratusa because it's all girls?" And then we spent like a couple of weeks trying to brainstorm something that sounded better. And we just couldn't come up with something because Eretusa does sound really cool. Yeah. And we're like, this Good is the thing. point of no return. If we don't change it now, once we go public with this and make a website and stuff, we're not going to be able to change it later. So it just stuck. And yeah. uh, I, I, I don't know. I like it. I still like the name. It's our identity now, right? <laughs> no returning back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, how many people were on the team in the first couple of months and how big is it now? Is there a sweet spot for you in your mind where the number of members is just right? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, if I recall correctly, I think uh, we started, uh, well, we started, you know, getting so, slowly some people in. Uh, but I think we we kept it first at 20 because, uh, you know, the reason for that was uh, we thought that having too many people in would discourage other people to share, like, deck lists and stuff, right? Like, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're share, you don't want to share with all your competitors uh, in a tournament, right, what you're playing. So we kept it at 20 at first to, uh, to keep it at that. Um, and that was good for a while, I think, um, until we started going a bit more into content creation, we kept at 20. At the moment, we are at 26 people. Uh, you know, and in that time, like a lot of people left, a lot of people joined, right? Um, I, <laughs> especially around midwinter, I think we had some, some leaks <laughs> that we, yeah. we renewed as we also got our website then. Uh, we searched for other people. First, we searched for, you know, people who were good at Gwent. Kind of the rule was, if you're better than the average of the group, uh, uh, you know, we were interested, I guess. <laughs> which which worked well, right? Because that yeah. snowballs a bit the level of the whole group. Um, but I think eventually we also searched for people with other talents, with, uh, you know, like writing articles or, uh, you know, uh, streaming like a Apero. Or, um, yeah, what else? Uh, managing talents also. So... Mm -hmm. uh, now we're at 26. Uh, I think we are still going to grow a little bit, you know, as we are trying to get um, trying to get enough people to get like all the content flowing as well to have like a constant stream of content on the website. Um, so I think we will have uh, a few more people, but 
you know, there's always kind of a, a line where it's too much. And especially with competitive players, um, competing with each other on the top of the pro ladder uh, is, is not what we want, right? We don't want, uh, we don't want people to miss out because um, in our team because other people get there. So it's always a bit um, awkward at that side. So like on competitive players, we also already have like kind of a gap that we don't want too much of them. Yeah, it makes sense. And are there any, like, you already mentioned some big brands, just like uh, the player size and content creation size, but are there any other things going on with uh, our team Artusa right now? Are there any other major points which you are working on but are not that well mentioned like the players are? Um, yeah, I think, you know, in a sense, um, it, the website is, I think, one of the biggest uh, projects we're working on right now. Uh, and like I said, I think the goal for there is to have like a constant stream of content on there. Um, at the start when the website just released, you know, we, we didn't have that much content creator. So it was a bit, um, well, I, there, there was like not steady streaming. There was like one article each week or something. Maybe I'm even generous there, but I don't know. Um, and now, you know, we, we at least have like two things a week. We have the meta snapshot with it. We have the, um, we have like a lot, a lots of other tools. Kachna did a great job on those. Um, so, you know, there are way more reasons to visit their website now, and that's uh, kind of where we're striving for. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Actually, like, that's something I'd like to mention. Like, people think that making such an article or getting a snapshot in or something doesn't take that much time, actually. But I remember making some myself in, like, December or something. But mm -hmm. that takes way too much time. It's ridiculous. I spent 10 hours on something and then CDPR is like, sure, we have a new patch and then everything is gone. <laughs> yeah, it's that's, so hard to work on. That's the only advantage of homecoming, right? That yeah. We, that we, know, <laughs> we have a lot of time to make an article. <laughs> really looking at the silver lining here, guys. Yeah, always possible. <laughs> so, Heno, is the team currently recruiting? Are there specific roles that you're looking for right now? What can someone do if they're interested in joining the team? Um... I think, you know, at the moment, at least uh, for the player side, we are a bit closed. Um, as as I've said earlier, you know, we don't want to compete too much uh, with each other on pro ladder yeah. and stuff. Um, you know, also, I think we got a bit more picky in players. Uh, you know, as I said, we want always want people who are above the average of the group. I think we still kind of have that rule. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, I think on the player side, we're not recruiting at the moment as we have like a good bunch of people that we're happy with. Um, but on the content creation side, you know, we're, we're still looking for people who are interested in um, who are interested in making content like videos or articles. Uh, so if you're interested, then uh, send us an email. You can find our email address on the website or send me a message on Discord. Cool. Sounds great. Yeah. And uh, sometimes we have like other roles that, uh, you know, that come up that we need for our management uh situation like uh, you know we had a content manager like a pr manager recently um and some of these roles uh, i post always on the discord to see if people respond to those so keep an eye out for that if you're interested can you tell a little bit more about the website what people can fight on there if people don't know about it yet yeah of course um at the moment uh what we have on the website is uh a variation of some tools and some articles uh on the tool side we have uh, you know, we have the meta snapshot, we have an arena picker, uh, and we have a uh, pick and ban tool. Uh, you know, all three are really useful uh, in the sense of um, finding information. Like the arena picker, I think, um, arena picker is also really useful. I do it sometimes to search up uh, specific cards when I'm, you know, a bit too lazy to go into game or like I'm, <laughs> I'm theory crafting, you know, in train or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, and apart from that, we also have uh, we also have articles and videos. Like um, I think we have like one deck guide every week in video form of Green Cricket. We have um, we also have like sporadic articles. We have uh, now a new one for for the Monster Arena mode. So uh, we we also keep doing those. So we are uh, kind of expanding in that. Uh, I think in the future we're also looking at uh, you know more interviews with uh, with people from, uh, from the community. So like. Uh, players who make it to the open or the challenger cool really looking forward to that yeah i mean the website has a lot of good stuff so if you guys haven't checked it out definitely uh take a look team all right thanks heno um thank you thanks. so much for talking with us what we're gonna do here is we're gonna uh go to a quick video from green cricket uh and then 
we'll talk with Demorcus, and afterwards we'll get both of you guys together. We'll have a group discussion. So stay on the line, Heno. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back right after this with Demorcus. Welcome back to our card spotlight where we look at the lore background and mechanics of interesting cards that don't see love play. Also, spoilers for Witcher 2 ahead. This ranked season is all about dragons, so let's look at the daughter of the famous dragon villain Treadmurf, Sarsenthesis, or more broadly known as Saskia, the dragon slayer or the virgin of Edom. Thanks to her mother being the green dragon Mokhtrabrake and her father being a golden dragon, she inherited the ability to polymorph, even though she could only use it in a limited manner. Her only available form was the one of a beautiful human maid, and after meeting Yorveth, they both came up with the whole Saskia the Dragonslayer story to avoid suspicion. In dragon form, she was quite powerful, but our favorite witcher was able to outwit her in combat twice, and depending on your actions in The Witcher 2, her fate would be entirely different one. In Quent, Sarsenthesis is represented by multiple times, but today we look specifically at the card Sarsenthesis Plays, which banishes your hand and then makes you draw that many cards. Banishing your hand means that it won't be discarded to your graveyard, therefore it won't be triggering any synergies. However, it thins your deck quite massively, and it enables you to get rid of cards you don't want to have in your hand, making her an exciting card in Arena or in decks where you want to look up specific key cards. With her in your deck, you need to adopt another playstyle, because you want to mulligan away the cards you want to play and get cards you don't want to play onto your hand, so the synthesis plays can banish them. I challenge you to try out and experiment with her, and if you craft a nice deck, then just share it in your team or to the Discord, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you can come up with. And now, back to the show. Welcome back, everybody. That was another awesome video brought to you by green cricket check out his youtube channel if you haven't already he's got a lot of good stuff on there <clears throat> and now we're back with uh the other co-admin of team eratusa demorcus how are you doing demorcus great to have you on here today i'm doing great thanks how are you guys doing very very good um good. so tell us a little bit about yourself uh what do you do on the team right now what are you involved with um well i joined the team last year in uh, fall and um, I quickly find uh, found myself with a passion for the competitive side of gaming, um, since I'm an economist in real life and um, have, have to do a lot of uh, like deal with a lot of math. I uh, was kind of a way, in a way intrigued by ways to optimize gaming or optimize the way one uh, can perform Gwent, and uh, I think the team is uh, really doing a really good job at it. And uh, as one of the admins as, uh, of Team Artusa, I'm uh, especially keeping track of uh, our competitive performance. So I'm uh, trying to discover new ways to uh, improve um, your own gameplay. So whenever someone joins us uh, within the team, like my goal is to, uh, to have him say after two or three months to me or her, uh, the team really helped me to improve as a player. And uh, that's working out great so far. And can you go a little bit more into detail on the admin job? What are you doing? Everything? How are you helping those people perform better? Because that's what mm. people want to know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, basically, uh, my admin role is quite diverse. Um, with Heno, we share most of the work. Um, he's doing a lot of the social part, um, communicating with people of the recruiting job. What I do mostly is um, finding uh, new um, opportunities for Artusa to grow in terms of uh, competitiveness, for example, finding um, uh, like also on one hand, the right players uh, for the right roles, but on the other hand, to um, encourage scrim sessions, um, try to find uh, analytical approaches to the game, like with Kochua stats, for example. And uh, mostly I try to find also new um yeah market opportunities for team artusa branches where we can grow where we can improve our content mm -hmm. and uh, what we produce it's uh, just the typical things that an economist would like to do <laughs> well can you believe it's already been since the inception of artusa it's uh 
I feel like we've done so much in, in the past year. What do you think, in your opinion, are some of the major accomplishments of the team? I mean, if I would uh, try to trash talk here a bit, I would say uh, the major accomplishment would be to survive top deck. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that, that's a bit mean. It's that, okay. But uh, still, I mean, uh, they were our biggest competitor at the start, and uh, we couldn't even uh, call ourselves their competitor because um, we... Um, kind of quickly figured out that we wanted to do something completely different. We were very competitive mm -hmm. from the start. And um, I think that uh, the biggest milestones have been, uh, of course, publishing our homepage. It's like having a web presence is a really big deal for every uh, competitive team. Um, what I think is also um, the major, like the best thing that has happened to us is um, and on me having to write notes for people who to recruit in a team because uh, whenever we wanted to uh, have something have someone join the team what was our kind of uh, motto for it is we we want someone to join who can uh, who not only is a good player or is a passion or is passionate about the game but can also uh, teach us something or uh, can help us improve and uh, we followed that policy through all the recruiting process and we and it led to us having people that we didn't hire people that qualified for tournaments we hired people where we saw the potential and uh, those people evolved within the team they found new ways to expand their uh, cap their skill in Gwent um, they found new friends and uh, they made it we have uh, people in almost every open now we have people in uh, the Challenger. We have uh, two guys competing, and that's a really big accomplishment. And uh, for me, it's uh, I'm of course really glad that the team helped me to uh, be part of that story as well. That's great. A little bit uh, stroking your own back with the <laughs> Challenger accomplishment, but that's cool. <laughs> can you also I'm happy like? About that. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, man. I I'm pretty jealous to be honest. <laughs> but it's it's really awesome. And can you tell a little bit more of the um, approach that you that that the team Artusa players take uh, into pro ladder seasons and getting better at the game itself? Yeah. I mean, uh, when I entered the scene and uh, I realized that I I I didn't never consider myself to be one of the most most intelligent players or something. I thought that uh, the pro pro ladder is a lot about discipline, and so do all of our players. They play quite disciplined they uh they try to um whenever they play they ask themselves what is the right approach to uh, play and uh, what are the right decks at the right time there are, you can imagine uh, as a like the pro ladder it's like uh, a string of time where there are times where it's bad to play and there are times where you should play a lot and uh, there are also times where particular things are really good i mean you don't bring a knife to a gunfight <laughs> and uh, you don't bring faultes to a consume meta. So uh, those are like the little things that you uh, should be aware about. And Top think, tier analogies here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we do this, these kinds of things, uh, taking a look at the meta, finding the right decks, sharing the information within the team, but also, um, which is even more important, helping everyone to understand a deck better. Like when you start a deck, it really takes a lot of time to be like a pro at it and with the team you can just uh, hit someone up and say hey can you teach me the deck i know you played it a lot and they just uh scream two three games with you and suddenly you understand a lot and you see plays that you haven't seen before and that uh is like a high like skill or learning curve that you wouldn't achieve anyone anywhere else yeah, that's a really good answer. Thanks for that. For that. Um, so both you and Andy Wan will be playing in the upcoming Challenger. Big congratulations for that, first of all. Uh, have you started preparing already? Uh, will you be doing anything different regarding the preparation this time around compared to previous Opens? And finally, do you think it's advantageous or disadvantageous to prepare together with your teammate? Um, a lot of questions. I covered the uh, last <laughs> one first. So. Yeah. Is it this advantageous or advantageous to prepare a teammate? I think it's uh, advantageous because um, let's see what would be the disadvantage. We know each other's decks, and uh, that's almost it. If we if we play uh, each other's lineups directly against each other, we also know how to play against the other guy. But apart from that, it's nothing that wouldn't happen anyways in a semi-final scenario, right? 
-hmm. in the semi-final scenario you would also know the opponent's deck so i think um, playing uh, like preparing together takes a little bit of trust and uh, within the team we are not only co-workers or uh, or teammates who play uh, the game at the same time but we are uh, more than it like i I think that uh, a lot of people, or almost everyone in the team, I would consider a friend of mine. So uh, that's uh, it. Really, is enjoyable to prepare together, to discuss a lot, and also what a really good thing is in preparation, I can uh, form my group out of the team members in Team Artusa and can really rely on that when I have an idea or I have a problem with a deck, and then I ask it, they not only come back to me, but I also can say I trust in the person's opinion because I know he's a good player, he's respected, or he knows what he's saying. And that's a really good thing. So I don't really think preparing with two guys um, and knowing your deck is a disadvantage. And I enjoyed the prep for Open together with Andy as much as I enjoyed the Open with uh, Dutch Boy for uh, the Open before. And... Uh, that uh, the open with uh, preparation of Molich. And uh, for the first part of the question, could you repeat it again, please? Yeah, I was asking, have you started preparing already for Challenger and will you be doing anything different this time around? Yes, so uh, two things. Have I started preparing already? Yes, um, I have uh, two lineups that I am uh, considering, one more than the other. And uh, now it's kind of time to tune the decks. And after that, I'm going to um, play uh, a few uh, practice matches against my teammates. I think what I will do this time differently is I want to play team matches against my uh, teammates, record both sides, and then uh, cut it together into a video so I can actually have a better uh, feeling for anticipating my opponent's hand. I think that um, once I will do that, I will be able to play more calm because often when you play, it's like... It, in tournaments, especially when you play uh, non-greedy or greed decks, you think, oh my god, what if my opponent has the perfect hand, mm -hmm. and then I can never get my card back. But sometimes <clears throat> you, it, it it takes a bit of time to develop the right feeling for it. So and what you're saying is you're trying to train your mind into having like a map hack or a wall hack. Train yeah, your mind into basically knowing exactly what your opponent has in their hand without being able to see it. That's pretty pretty ingenious. I think uh, on one hand you should know like uh, when you go to the tournament you should know how to play your deck and sleep, right? You because that's <laughs> that's how you should yeah. be prepared. But on the other hand you don't know what to expect of your opponent, and uh, that's the point where you shouldn't get anxious, but you should uh, realize okay he plays card A. This implies that he does not have an answer for this, or if he didn't catch up this time and he had the opportunity to do so, it doesn't make sense. So he does not have the answer already. Mm -hmm. And the other part of my preparation is a fitness preparation. So this is a Skellige Challenger. I already taught the guys about it's a <laughs> the muscular and manly Challenger and I cannot allow my biceps to be smaller than tailbots. So of course <laughs> I will uh, go as much to the gym as it's necessary. Probably that's gonna take me two days. Tailbots oh, are oh. not so big after all, but uh, yeah. Oh. See you at Challenger Tailbot. Six flex. <laughs> Damn. Whew. Wow. I don't, I don't know how I can, like, change the subject now. It's so hard. <laughs> He's blown me away. <laughs> Fuck. Okay. Straight feet. Back to Gwent. Because that's also important. If people want to get good at Pro Ladder, give them some advice. Like, maybe sleep more. Maybe actually, like, eat or something. I don't know. Get something to drink. Be. Yeah. Yeah, that would definitely help. I think without that, you won't get too far. But um, well, wait, what is the best piece of advice? So yeah. Um, first of all, I think uh, playing pro ladder all by yourself. I mean, just uh, playing the ladder and not getting any feedback about how you play is um, is a way that you can go, but it's not recommendable. I would uh, try to. Um, get in like the exchange with other players i found extremely valuable for my own uh, game and for my own uh, opportunity to improve myself so first of all uh, join a community or find a group of uh, players and or friends that play the game as well and try to understand what you're doing uh, wrong what you're what you could have done better this is the one important thing so the other thing is learn the decks before you play them at pro ladder 
take a bit of time to uh, do your plays. Don't rush into it. And uh, yeah. there, the other thing is, um, and like there is something I noticed when I played the product myself. When you play decks like Consume, for example, and then you you see Calvit and it's Alchemy, and then you say like, I could play around spheres all the game, and then I would win. But I could, but this is like so excruciating and takes ages to calculate everything, or I could just play like he doesn't have it, and if he has it, okay, I lose. And uh, this attitude, like the second one, I mean, it allows you to play more games, and it allows you to just ru go from one game to another, more relaxed. But the the other one is something that has to do with discipline, and I think uh, like in any other sportsmanship, and like in any other sport or uh, game, uh, if you bring up the necessary discipline and determination, you will get further. Yeah, I think those really are good. great points. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, coming back to the team, Eritus, as a whole, what are the future goals for the team and both in and out of the competitive scene? Are there any future projects in the works? I mean, uh, first goal, we want to be the best team in Gwent. This has <laughs> been always our goal, and uh, we work pretty hard on it, and I think we're on a good way or we are pretty close to uh, getting there. Uh, the other thing is um, we had already talked about the content creation, and uh, I really like how we um, how we are able to um, increase the capability of everyone who's joining our team competitively. Like everyone who's joining at a competitive player after m two months can say, I really improved at the game, the team helped me so much. And I also want this to be the case for content creators, so I really want content creators to be more successful with us and uh, that's a part of a development that we are uh, investing in right now and the other thing that we are working on is some a really big project that we are in cooperation with and team uh, with uh, cdpr and it hasn't been announced yet so it's kind of a homecoming league actually <laughs> Because it's oh. a leak uh, from something that we are working on, uh, we will build an entire uh, Gwent Artusa Academy, and uh, the Artusa Academy will offer all the new players or players uh, unfamiliar with concepts after homecoming to uh, get into the game, understand a lot of things that have been an issue for new players in Gwent, like starting even with uh, card effects. Uh, with effects like hazards and boons, with uh, buff and strengthen, what's the difference between it. But then we will go also and provide more sophisticated lessons for people who already understand the game but would like to improve at an intermediate level, like sequencing, for example, finding the right passing spots, or um, anticipating your opponent's uh, hands, and so on. Those are more difficult things for products, and we will build an entire school where you can uh, go on a path, earn an Artusa certificate in the end. We'll, it will give you a title on our private Discord, on our public Discord, and uh, <laughs> you have a lot more things to unlock and a lot of achievements. It will be really fun and uh, it will be a big production for us. So stay tuned. Definitely, this is going to be a great project. Wow, that's huge. That sounds oh, really yeah. big and very uh, ambitious. Uh, <laughs> So I'm sorry. Did you mention is this going to be a collaboration with CDPR at all? Like I'm actually I'm actually asking for real because I don't know too much. <laughs> we have been uh, we we pitched our idea to CDPR. They really liked it. Um, I cannot reveal yet in how far we will uh, collaborate uh, with CDPR on that. But um, we uh, introduced them our concept. They liked it, and it will feature um, kind of lessons and a path where you can go. You can uh, imagine, like uh, anyone who played Slay the Spire, for example, knows like do, do you have different ways to achieve your goal, and so it will be also with our uh, our Tuesday Academy. You uh, can uh, do different lessons. You can do as many as you want and repeat also some of those. And uh, all the lessons will be about different concepts, uh, also, but not only about the game itself, but also about communities, opportunities to improve at the game outside, analytical tools, and so on. And uh, you wow. can unlock uh, unlock your path there, uh, go uh, a level further. You can achieve rank. It's it will be like a small game yourself, a small game of improving <laughs> your own skill in Gwent. And you can stop at any time. You can start anytime again, and it's just for everyone there out there who says, "I really like the uh, game after homecoming." It's uh, I'm passionate about it. I want to improve. I want to uh, check uh, 
if I can uh, get higher win rates, if I can learn new decks that I haven't tried yet because I was unfamiliar with the concept and how it works or it looked all too complicated for me, that would be the perfect opportunities for all the people to get an easy um, touch of that and uh, try out something new. That sounds absolutely amazing. Uh, I can't wait to see how that how that takes shape and and also want to be a part of that project as well. All right. I'm really happy that a lot of people from the community also will be involved. We will not only involve like our own Team Artusa celebrities like Shinmiria, for example, <laughs> but also um, other players from the Gwent community that um, have really um, helped the game to grow and which are known for being um, big at a certain deck or a certain faction. And uh, it will be a big collaboration. Yeah, that's awesome. awesome. So I uh, thank you so much, Demorcus. I think at this point we're gonna bring Heno back, and we're gonna go to the group discussions portion of the talk show. Welcome back, Heno. How are you doing? There I am again. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Look at uh, the shadows. So we gotta we gotta talk a little bit more about the Eratusa anniversary. This is huge. Um, looking back on this past year, I, I want to ask you guys what. What was your favorite part, or what is your favorite part of being part of the team, being in Team Eratusa? Heno, do you want to start? Ooh, that's a tough one, actually. Um, yeah, I think about. I think you know the the best part of being in the team is I think also what Damo mentioned a bit is that we're getting along with each other well. You know, it feels like we're all working to one goal. Uh, you know, we're working together, and there's a good group cohesion. Um, so you know, just hanging out and uh, you know, actually also playing the game with each other mm -hmm. um, and working on projects, you know, like this talk show together is uh, a lot of fun, actually. Great. Awesome. Mm, for for me, the best thing is, um, I think in a way, the, yeah, also the people that we are in, but in particular, Heno, because when you oh, start up, oh, so no, when, when, you, when you start up something uh, ambitious, like uh, Team Artusa, Definitely the start that the goals we had were very far. Like uh, we we wanted to get where we are today, but at that point of time it was uh, like very ambitious. And some people told us, "Man, you're way over your head there." But um, when you start up something like this, it takes a partner, uh, like or someone to work with you that you can trust and you can uh, rely on him. And uh, that was really the case with Heno. He stepped up when I was uh, more busy with the uh, competitive side, when I was uh, participating in open tournaments. Um, he uh, took some weight off my shoulders, and that was really great. I mean, no cup up rights here, but <laughs> it was a um, good collaboration. And I'm really cup thankful right. for uh, having, some, having the chance to work with someone uh, who is um, very productive and kind on one hand, and also for peop uh, with people who are very productive and sometimes a little bit rude on the other side, like going to town, still love you going to town. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the, the kind of more of a rough spirit and uh, the team is really diverse you have to really really uh, shiny people who are going happy places and you have the people in <laughs> dark places and Just... all of them are great at Gwen <laughs> oh. well said man yeah I think yeah. Uh, you know it's interesting um, how we work together like you said uh, I think I sometimes have more of the social parts but Jack you are uh, you know, you are like really disciplined and goal related. And I think that's something yeah. I'm missing sometimes. Um, and that's where it really goes well with us. Like, uh, you know, we kind of, um, we kind of strengthen each other's flaws um, or like compensate for them, yeah. which really, uh, which this really is... wheels work together. Sorry, guys. This, this is turning into the Hannah yeah. and the I was just saying, I think like it's a pseudo relationship, relationship show. <laughs> we have to cut it here. <laughs> we, we can talk about your chemistry later, guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> How about you, Dutch boy? I mean, uh, when I came in, I mostly came in for the players and like getting better at Gwent. I mostly like I'm always a very competitive player and want to get better at whatever I'm doing. But I was actually pleasantly surprised by the amount of like family feel you get from Team Artusa and also just more getting to know the people more and having fun with people. I actually started streaming and also hung out with you, Shimiri, and uh, Apero on stream, and that was great fun. We were just, like, hunting Dugarons or something, and it was hilarious. <laughs> like, like, and also, in like, we have in the um, private Discord channel, we have a, re a real-life channel, and that's actually really active, and people are caring about 
giving dating advice and everything. It's hilarious. <laughs> I just love that. <clears throat> yeah, I have to second that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I have to second what you, all you guys said about the people. The people in the team are amazing. You guys, uh, Heno and Demorcus, you guys did a great job with recruiting over the past year. Um, not only are is everybody really passionate about Gwent, but they're just great people to get along with. Um, and on the topic of the additional channels in the private Discord, I have to shout out the meme channel in our private <laughs> Discord. Right. We've got a lot of good stuff there. It's a lot of good material. Probably can't share all that with the public, but <laughs> <laughs> some really juicy stuff there. Uh, all right. And for next, we know now that we all love Farm Tusa, but what is the most like the most memorable moment that we all had here? And I'll up you first. Um, I think I think one big moment. I, you know, I'm actually going to do two guys, but I think one big moment was actually uh, challenger number two when uh, when Jura played for us. I think that was kind of a turning point for the team. Um, we we talked to Jura beforehand, and he kind of uh, went on a hiatus after qualifying for the challenger. So you know, he came uh, he came in a bit a bit rusty, right? Um, we worked we worked I think for you know. Uh, three weeks or like a month, uh, you know, with him and we, we started preparing him and it was really awesome to get him there. But it was also kind of a test for us how how well, you know, we could do at something like uh, like a big event, you know, which was kind of the goal for us. So it was kind of having a head start for us. Or like a, uh, we were kind of cheated ourselves in one sense, you know, for to test out one time how, you know, how far we are from where we want to be. And actually, uh, you know, it was like a great adventure. For, for all of us, actually, you know, we were all invested in it. Uh, and seeing him actually, you know, wearing an Aratusa shirt there, uh, playing there, um, you know, was really a good moment for me. And I think also for the rest. Uh, another moment has to do with, with Andy. I think it's uh, it's actually uh, the moment where he qualified for the for the Open, um, which was really funny. Yes, he, he was kind of far off from it the day before, like 24 hours before, and he kind of decided to go like on a, sick long run for it right he went like 24 hours of consume uh you know yeah. so it was we we all coped a bit with him during the day and stuff you know we talked with him like hey man how are you doing come on keep up and then you know i went to sleep and uh, I, I i woke up in the night you know checked my phone i'm like okay he's doing better i fell asleep again and the next morning you know i woke up and i see he's really close to it you know so we kind of hopped in the voice and talked about it and then he overtook it like with 20 minutes to go he just uh overtook yeah. i Overtook Nuke, Nilfk then, you know, who had uh, played a lot of games that season, you know, to get there, <laughs> you know, which um, which was really a great moment for for us, actually, for all of us, right? He played uh, 24 hours, you know, to get there. He was all exhausted, you know, he couldn't he couldn't take it anymore, actually. He he really wanted to go to bed, but it was like really fantastic. And then to have him eventually win that Open, you know, was yeah, yeah. and it's huge. It's, uh... That basically led to the situation now where he's in Challenger. Very, very good chance of taking that as well. So really looking forward to that. Demarcus, how about you? Both of you are simultaneously shouting at me. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's the other way around. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, what was the like my favorite moment? I had a lot of nice moments, but uh, I think one of those that um, stayed really in my memory um, what happened actually outside of Artusa about Artusa so uh, when I was I think at the second open um, uh, like a few of the CDPR people and uh, the casters and uh, other players they talked to me about Artusa and uh, they told me that uh, we are doing great work and that they really appreciate what we are doing and uh, that it's uh, basically nice to exchange with us and see that uh, the grant community is growing. And uh, I I was really thankful of that because uh, it's like not obvious to get uh, such a recognition and uh, such, such appreciation. And I was really thankful for that moment to see that the work that we are doing within the team is not only um, reaching people within, but also people outside. And uh, that was great. Okay. Shit. I'm... All right. So for me, I have I have two favorite moments as well. So one is uh, we we obviously have more European members than North American members uh, on the team, just because of how Gwent's population is. But I really enjoyed some of our like 
NA chat sessions on Discord. Like, it's, this is like the wee morning hours in Europe and their evening hours in North America. It's like me, gluten, octopus, lock in, just like shooting the, you know, shooting the shit, talking about Gwent, having like 500 line Discord conversations for the European guys when they wake up, uh, <laughs> arguing about. Kara versus <laughs> how, if if Kara Metz is good or not, there's some crazy memories there. And then the other thing is um, is when I first started streaming, I wrote a veterans guide, and that's that's very uh, very high up there for sentimental value for me because that's kind of what got my whole streaming uh, career started with the you know 1439 FMMR with vets and just. Starting off with no cam, just getting you know very very loyal fan base started. It's it's really touching and it's it's something that will always uh, stay with me forever. Yeah, I just want to cut in for a second here, so you guys in chat can actually like imagine this. Imagine being an admin of a Discord group. You wake up in the morning and then you see three hundred plus uh, missed messages, and you just start Damn. scrolling a, like a, uh, like through those and like three hundred plus messages about Kira Mets. Like <laughs> it's like ridiculous and like this this was a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> she was a bad card back then. <laughs> oh, you were just jealous. <laughs> You can tell who's on which side. <laughs> How about you, Dutch boy? I, I definitely second the streaming part. I tried out streaming for a bit, but wanted to go back to Pro Leather again and kind of fizzled out back there. But I really love the streaming and um, actually like seeing the same people come back again and interacting with them. It's just so much fun and it gives energy to see people come back to you again and actually being entertained by what you do and... Uh, watching you play the game again and it's way more fun than just playing the game for, for i don't know what i was doing before without team or so with six hours a day just playing alone on my laptop getting frustrated as hell because i couldn't <laughs> get to fmmr or something and that's also helped with the team like getting some friends to play along with and also playing along with friends is just so much fun and yeah. i have to also say the fact the dating the dating stuff is amazing. I think it's better than Netflix or anything. So I really want to know how it plans out. I'm not going to go too much into detail because the person maybe doesn't want to share it, but damn. I want to make a Netflix series out of this maybe somewhere. Get, in get our reality TV show dosage from yeah. uh, Team yeah. Team well, also really cool is that, uh, We have like our usual suspects on the Discord channel. We have like Andy, Molegion, me, and Gwen to Town. Hanging out like uh, when like last season, for example, for the Proda, hanging out every evening almost in the Discord channel, and we have oh, this yeah. music bot requesting always Spanish music and stuff. <laughs> and hanging out and request starting to request weird songs like Force and Kappa or so, oh, and uh, then oh we just God. kept playing on for hours, and uh, it's always so enjoyable when you don't have to grind your Proda <clears throat> yourself. You just uh, play with your teammates, talk a bit more about it, and then you can. Uh, hear Sergio cursing, no, no, oh my god, <laughs> and then Andy, I cannot believe this, and then it's, and when Morgan getting also salty in between, oh no, free ointments, yeah. <laughs> and like all of this, like, you know, when you're in a when you're in a group chat and you you know you're playing together, then everyone can get a laugh, and then you can keep on going. You're not so salty yet anymore. I mean, a bit still, but it's okay. Yeah, so, just an absolute great time just hanging out with, with teammates. A lot of fun. All right, so getting back to a little bit more serious questions. Uh, obviously, homecoming is on a lot of people's minds. Do you guys think homecoming will have a big impact on the team? And if so, how? Is, is the team expected to grow in size after homecoming? What, what do you guys think? Mm, I think... I, um, I think what it you know means for us is... Uh, Back then, you know, when it was announced, it meant for us that we have like kind of a deadline to work on, right? So it's pretty nice to know um, when, you know, when you kind of want to be done with getting everyone together, getting, you know, a bit organized and getting, uh, you know, the people you want and getting enough content on the website. Uh, so, you know, back then it was nice to have a deadline, but about homecoming itself, it's obviously like really exciting for all of us. Um, we are all pretty invested in this game, I think, safe to say. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, being here on a talk show with all of us about this game. Um, you know, I think it's safe to say that we are all, you know, excited to see what's coming up on there. 
um, I think for the team, you know, it means um, it means if homecoming is successful, you know, it means that you know we have uh, a whole new adventure for us together, um, you know. And if it's not successful, you know, then we have to uh, think think again, like what we will do with Gwent and how it will work and uh, what what the future for this team will hold. Yeah, I agree. I mean, our goal was at the very start, or at the start of the year at least, um, by then, um, to be like the uh, strongest team in Gwent and until homecoming to have a kind of a roadmap. It's it's a biased word by now, but <laughs> roadmap prepared for uh, after homecoming. And I think that um, we've uh, yeah we've got there. And uh, now I'm looking forward to. Uh, to the yeah, homecoming release as everyone else. I think it will change the team a bit because with homecoming, I expect a lot of new players to join and a big demand for content. Um, maybe uh, some not only passionate competitive players, but also passionate content creators will find their way into Gwent. And uh, yeah, we will be looking out for uh, talents to join the team to help us uh, produce more high quality content for the webpage. People who want to collaborate with us on the Grand Artusa Academy, and so on. And I think uh, that, uh, yeah, I mean, it might be the case that uh, there will be players within the team that are competitive now, and uh, they uh, decide to do something else after the homecoming reads. That's that's always a risk, and that's how fast changing the game industry is. But I believe that the increase of the player base will bring up a lot of new competitive players that we are not having yet on our radars and let's see uh, if we can collaborate with them in the future uh, our t priority however is always though to keep our uh, competitive player pool small and reasonable so no one is uh, in like internal uh, you know competition uh, mm. with with uh, his teammate but uh, let's see how it shapes and I'm looking forward to it Awesome. What are you guys' thoughts on uh, the homecoming? I think uh, you guys covered it pretty well for me. Like, I obviously, you know, it's going to have a huge impact on the game, on the team. We're very invested. Uh, I, I just really look forward to seeing to seeing all the new features and getting seeing all the uh, the community grow and expand. Uh, I'd really like to see Gwent get to a point where we'll have like community tournaments. Uh, every other week, or regional tournaments, maybe in NA, maybe in Europe, Asia, stuff like that. And I want to see those community tournaments feed into the Gwent Master system. Um, and I th think that Eratusa could definitely be involved with those sort of community tournament um, sort of system. So I think that's one of the ways that that would impact our team and our content creation going forward as well. I think that's also a good point. I, I definitely want more tournaments right now with only open and there are some other tournaments, but there aren't that many big tournaments going on in Gwent right now. I think it's something that would be amazing uh, coming back from a Hearthstone um, background. I've played a lot of weekly tournaments and I still remember the first weekly tournament I did and the first weekly tournament I saw. I remember... Um, uh, meeting Mitsuhide online, who's actually doing pretty good right now, and seeing him play a weekly tournament on a Saturday evening and winning 50 euros, which is a crazy <laughs> amount for a 14 year old. Just winning 50, <laughs> 50 euros in one night is amazing. So I wanted to play too, and I wanted to get that easy money too, and I failed horribly at everything. But it was amazing, and it was a lot of fun. And I think that getting that to Gwent would be really cool as well. And coming back to Homecoming, uh, it's definitely cool if the game you like gets uh, bigger and bigger. Because a bit, the bigger the game, the better the competitive side, the bigger the the better the content creation side, and the more people will get attracted to it. Which means that if you are a team or a website or whatever you are inside the game, you'll also get the bonuses of having the bigger pyramid, so to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good luck, Shin. <laughs> You're up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I already went. Fuck. I already went. Yeah. Already went. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Keep right. Away, so, that's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <clears throat> All right. Uh, final question for you guys. Yes. Uh, does the team have any plans to expand into other games in the future? What do you guys think? Yes, we are currently working on a big branch on um, Super Seducer competitive play. Jesus. Uh, but uh, no, <laughs> in reality, we are uh, we are pretty good. 
um, I think um, that uh, right now. So what I think is uh, Witcher 3 was my favorite game and still is of all times, even though Gwent is out. Uh, but um, yeah, Gwent is my favorite card game and I want to help develop the Gwent community. I want to see Homecoming succeed. And I think after Homecoming, we will have our hands busy, guys. So uh, we will maybe not have time at the start to expand in some other um, card games or in some other competitive games. But uh, for what I think it's worth, it's um, that, um, yeah, Homecoming will be exciting and uh, it will take us a bit of time to yeah, perfect the competitive uh, surrounding there to uh, create the content at the level where Hannah and me are saying, I am satisfied because Hannah and me are never saying we are satisfied. <laughs> oh and, man, uh, this is never going to end, is it? <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck here now. Oh, and no. uh, yeah, and um, I think we are good with Gwent. What do you say, Ken? Yeah, I agree. You know, like we are Team Air 2s after all, which is, of course, a Witch Universe name. Uh, I think, you know, as a team, like everyone is all really passionate about Gwent as well. Um, so it, I think it would be hard to transition into another game. If we would, I think it wouldn't be Team Aratusa, but it would be something else. That being said, you know, we do occasionally play other games with each other. I had uh, actually me and a pair of never lost League of Legends game together. So. <laughs> what? Wow, that's an interesting <laughs> statistic. I didn't know that. <laughs> Pretty good. But uh, no, you know, I think um, we, you know, we can play some other stuff with each other in that sense, but uh, we're not looking at uh, going competitive in another game at the moment. Yeah, it also yeah. doesn't really fit the name, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, so like, no, I, I think Team Artusa, what the fuck? I think it <laughs> makes a lot of sense that Gwen is just going to be our main focus for now and uh, everything else is just secondary. But I know my, my viewers are going to be disappointed that we're not starting a competitive Slay the Spire division. Hey, we will be that, that, the that's the one I would be open for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Any Slay the Spire players? <laughs> All spam Hanno? <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to move on to the viewer question portion of this show. Just so you guys know, we do take uh, pre-prepared questions in our public Eratusa Discord. So in the future, for future shows, if you want to ask questions and have, if you want to have your question be featured on the show, make sure you join our public Discord. The link's down below in the info section, and uh, you can submit your questions in the talk show channel there. All right, let's, let's see what we got. First question, with Homecoming on the horizon, what do you think about the changes that have been leaked so far? So that'll be like the two rows, two copies of bronzes, provisions, maybe limited hand size. Um, I think Birja also mentioned like potential active abilities on last Gwent talk. What do you guys think? Hanno? Um, yeah, I think I'm at least uh, pretty excited about the active abilities. I think uh, you know, it's most cards, I, I think almost all of them are, uh, you know, deploy effects, you know, so when you play them, the effect goes in. Except for, you know, a few of them, we have also timed cards and we have like dead wish cards, but for the rest, it's not really uh, versatile. So, you know, I would love to see more uh, versatility in the effects. Uh, about the two offs, I'm the two rows and also the two, two off of cards, I'm a bit, uh, yeah, well, a bit anxious. I think kind of what what I like is kind of the consistency. So when you make a deck, when you make a strategy, you know, you know you're going to play it. That's something that I, uh, you know, that's why I don't really like magic sometimes. It's because uh, you sometimes can draw really dead hands where you can't really even play your own stuff. And what I really enjoy about Gwent is that it, um, yeah, is that you can always at least play, you know, like you always have a chance to to play your cards even <laughs> even when you drew shit. So um, that's at least what I what I like. And, um, I hope that will say, uh, you know, what I hope is, I hope that the archetypes can have some more, can be a bit more versatile in a sense. Uh, one of my favorite decks actually is Consume, but something that I really hate about Consume is always the Knackers. Every deck uh, <laughs> is about the Knackers. And, you know, like, <laughs> if you want to be successful, you have to play it all in the Knackers, while some other cards like, uh, you know, the Harpies and uh, the Harpy X, you have the Arax Behemoth are not really played at the moment. Uh, you know, only one deck. <laughs> uh, I think I think it would be really cool if uh, you know 
if it wouldn't be if some cards would be a bit tuned so uh, it is not only about like one thing in strategy anymore but like a bit more versatile but yeah i think uh, we'll have to see what's coming on for this yeah, well, i think answer. a lot of people um what they really value about gwent is consistency because uh, building consistent decks allows you to activate your game plan every game and that uh, leads to like the more consistent something is maybe the more uh, skill intense it is. Uh, so I can understand a lot of people's uh, concerns about the two card limit and the two rows limit. It, uh, it sounds a bit like uh, taking away diversity or of options and taking away consistency. On the other hand, though, it's uh, hard to uh, make a good judgment on those changes because it's we, what a lot of people are uh, doing incorrectly, in my opinion, is judging changes on the status quo. I mean, the ground for uh, uh, homecoming may be entirely different from what we are used to now. Different game mechanics. We we have tutor cards at the moment, and um, they may be uh, also different kind of concepts that will be introduced in the game. So it's hard to uh, viably ex uh, evaluate the uh, changes now. What I think uh, is that uh, I have faith in CDPR to realize that the people value the game for being consistent. And I can understand that uh, in some terms, uh, Gwent feels urged to compete with other card games like Hearthstone, which have uh, a higher viewer base also because they are more spectacular by being watched. Like things mm -hmm. like uh, RNG cards impact uh, this sector attractiveness of a game of being watched uh, quite a bit. And mm -hmm. I hope that um, CDPR values the uh, approach there and the appreciation of the players to uh, be competitive because decks are consistent. And what I am kind of anticipating is that the limit to two cards might be uh, less of a consistency increase that some people think. That uh, they might make it possible for uh, because all decks have to run two, uh, two, like at least not more than two copies of a bronze card, they might be forced to combine uh, two archetypes. So a deck is not only reveal, a deck is not only um, consume, but it also is a hybrid, there will be more hybrid decks, for example. And um, hybrid decks can have, for example, more win conditions than the usual deck that relies on, as we had it in the times before, a long ground or weather effects only or a Joachim finisher, but uh, has different ways to find a win condition and that that will add the complexity to the game that we are afraid of missing out on having the decrease on two rows. Yeah, I, I think, think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think that's a really good point the market makes. I um, think it's I've... also an interesting point, uh, you know, what the demo said there. Uh, you know, I think... Uh, what some people were worried about at the start of Gwent was also uh, about archetypes being too prevalent, which means like, uh, you know, an archetype is kind of, uh, you know, a certain faction or like a certain, you know, like, like Uncrate or Skellig or something or, or like Consumis or Aerodin. Uh, and sometimes the boring part of that is that uh, it can be a bit boring, right? Because you sometimes, you know, in Aerodin deck, you, you, play your hounds, you play your frosts, you play your riders, right? Like you already already have like eight or nine cards set in that sense. And then and you need your drowners, of course, because you need to move the rows. So then you have a lot of your deck already predetermined. Uh, and what might be interesting if you what Damo said exactly like if you go to two cards uh, in each two bronze in each deck, it might make it so you have to be a bit more creative. I think a lot of people would would appreciate that. We have a lot of uh, we have a lot of passionate deck builders in the game so yeah for sure like That's a good point right now like you yeah exactly just as you said a lot of decks build themselves right now and there's not really that many flex spots and this will add more flex spots to decks yeah i think it, it would definitely help uh, especially the thing that the Morcus has also suggested i think that gwent right now has the problem uh does have the problem that they it it, it always becomes a little bit intuitive in the sense that it doesn't really matter what happens you always know your first five plays anyway because that's just how your deck works 
and you always want to know how you want to finish the game because you have these big gold cards that you want to finish with or like to restore you always want to finish with it just know that you never want to spend it early on and i think it would be great if um gwent games feel uh feels a little bit more variable in the sense that you can you have to make micro decisions more often than right now every single game instead of just a great sword play great sword play ship play great sword play ship mm-hmm. it's getting boring if you have like uh if you have to interact or you don't draw your great sword so now your boats are going to interact uh, boats are going to interact with the cursed units that you have it, it would be already a big um improvement on the system right now so i think that right. homecoming can give a lot it's going to be a delicate balance between finding the right amount of variance but also have the right amount of consistency at the same time for sure for me one of the uh one of the biggest things that i'm looking forward to in homecoming is the provision system which i don't think you guys mentioned but you basically it's going to be a new deck building resource and you basically use that resource to determine how many golds and silvers you can include in your deck i think that's kind of the gist of it so like right now we're forced to play four silver four golds and six silvers and with the provision system you could maybe sacrifice the gold to get like two silvers that would be huge for like a deck that i'm playing right now like the square hill deck that i'm playing right now i playing a Popco Gale deck with like Mahakam Horn. Hmm. I really, really want more silvers for the deck. <laughs> like I would be willing to sacrifice the gold for two silver slots for any day. Like yeah. it's just, it's, uh, it makes deck building a lot more flexible. I think it's more interesting. Again, one of the things that can potentially reward creative deck building. So that's something that I'm really looking forward to. It's definitely solid. All right, let's go on to Four. our next question then. <clears throat> This is from uh, the public error to the Discord. What is your opinion on the new matchmaking system on Pro Ladder? Does the Pro Ladder system need more improvement? How about we start with you first, Democris, since you are the resident expert on Pro Ladder? Mm-hmm. I, I think I have like um, several points on, uh, like several answers to that question. First of all, um, the Pro Ladder system, the new matchmaking system is really good. So. What you appreciate as a pro ladder is not having to play uh, games for plus three, plus three, plus three, lose one game by one point, minus 12. Or like yeah. plus three, plus three, Q into F net two times, minus 24. <laughs> and then it's like, that is like horrible. It's, just, it's yeah. a horrible experience, I can tell. And uh, also, like back in the time when they used to have Q bucks, you, you just have a Q buck. Minus, uh, minus like four games, and mm-hmm. thankfully they 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 fix those. So yeah, that is like matching really good. You get matched up with better players, um, and uh, it's uh, like you don't have those high casualties when you lose a game to a bad match. Um, there are like this is like uh, an advantage that outweighs all of the disadvantages, but there are several disadvantages with a new system. First of all, um, the uh, when you have to, you have to imagine when you have two players that are playing the game perfectly, the one is gonna lose who has the better, the worst matchup or worst draws, right? So that is kind of a problem. You sometimes get into the rock paper scissors, scissors situation, and uh, that's it's okay, but it's uh, not a really great experience, and it's hard to formulated that as a critique because it's uh, unavoidable by the definition of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, second mm-hmm. thing is um, um, pro ladder updates. Um, I I am personally uh, like first of all uh, like I'm I'm not a big fan of updating the pro ladder publicly to everyone because what can easily happen uh, is that you uh, are uh, you have the top 10 players so let's say top 12 competing for the top six slots yes and then you have mm. uh, uh, you have people directly competing against each other and you know like you're t- playing at the time when someone else is playing and uh, then someone else is seeing oh this guy is just uh, climbing with monsters the only viable monster deck is uh, consume so just let me casually queue great sorts with muscle coral and mandrake Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not like they are doing this by uh, sniping is a really hard word in the term, but they just queue your counter match up and by the 
new matchmaking, if they didn't play you into uh, in the last 30 minutes, they queue like this. Like it's like they just press the queue button when you finished your game, and they just meet you instantly. Yeah. Because... So you're saying the new system makes it much easier to like counter queue into somebody, especially yeah. your direct competition. And I find I think it's like uh, it's creating an an incentive for people to be bad sportsmanship. And I uh, I disliked it. And I think what I would suggest for homecoming is uh, updating the pro ladder for everyone personally. So you have to log on on the Masters when Masters homepage. And mm -hmm. after every game, you can update your score and see how much MMR you got and how much you lost. But people publicly cannot see the changes on your MMR in real life update, but they can see it in uh, frames of time, like every three hours, for example. Yeah. Um, That's a really good idea. I like that a lot. The other thing is hiding names. I must say that it was a suggestion. It is a suggestion in Gwent that is really old already, and it has been brought forward by the streamers, which have um, met the problem of stream sniping or uh, have felt like they have been stream sniped. And I think it's um, it's a vi it's a very valid point, and I have experienced. Uh, not so nice moments on the pro ladder where I queued a certain match up and I won or lost the game, and then instantly in the next game I was like kind of uh, getting destroyed by someone who was friends with the guy before and queued the <laughs> counter match up. And uh, I think that the um, that hiding the names would not really make a big problem. It doesn't seem like the most uh, big like. Uh, it can take a bit away from uh, the nice moments because when I queue, for example, against Colomon on the pro ladder, they're like, "Hey, Colomon, how are you doing? You're gonna lose!" Ha -ha. <laughs> and then, and then yeah. I, and then we play the game. But uh, it's it's kind of nice. But I uh, think that's one of the more like controversial uh, suggestions. It's definitely been suggested before, but there's pros and cons, and I think it's exactly. it's gonna be you have to weigh it out. I think on the pro ladder, mm -hmm. it is a point that uh, could be very much made, and uh, I uh, would appreciate it if it would be considered at least in any way. You could also have the option to reveal your game after the uh, after you reveal your name after the right. game. That would yeah. be great. I mean, that would be I would be okay with that. Like mm -hmm. those are like the two major critiques I have at the pro ladder. I think what is really good also at the pro ladder, uh, you have to play at least four factions. It creates a diverse meta, which is great for the game. Yep. Um, it forces people to be creative with the game, to exploit different mechanics, to ad adapt. Uh, so there are like the system of the project as a whole is great. I like it. Um, but uh, the um, in terms of sport esportsness, uh, if this is a word, or in teams of competitive <laughs> in terms of competitive uh, game. Uh, it has to be uh, improved. I think, yeah, I think you gave a very uh, in-depth answer. Um, what do you guys think about the notion that maybe 100 games per faction is too much? Do you think that's too much or too little? Like, um, is it too much of a grind right now? Any opinions on, on that, Dutch boy, Heno? I, I personally think that um, when CDPR came into Pro Letter, they kind of took the wrong, well, not necessarily the wrong, the too big of a dream approach. I think that mm -hmm. Pro Letter was meant for maybe like the 20% or 10% of what was actually in there. I think that Pro Letter um, turned into this testing zone for players that didn't really care about Pro Letter and actually only cared about ranked, where they just mm -hmm. tried out new decks. And they tried them out against the people that actually cared uh, in Pro Letter, and then you suddenly get uh, queued against this weird ethne deck that just removes everything and, well, mm -hmm. Your deck is the only deck that sucks against the deck, so you lose, and there goes 12 and more, like the Morcus said. And I think that's not what Pro Letter wants to be. I think the Pro Letter should mainly focus on those guys that focus on grinding, that have the time to spend those hours and get in there, and not so much on the guys that just have some fun on there. They should stay on ranked. But they already are kind of uh, moving more towards that and moving more to a higher um, skill cap. Also for the qualifiers, moving it to top 100, top 50, and I think they're going on the right track in that sense. Yeah, uh, I can. I want to make one small point here: is that uh, the problem you just named matchmaking fixes that also because you don't get yeah. really match with the uh, with, with the people, yeah. which is also uh, another improvement that it brought. 
Yeah, definitely. Good one. Yeah, I actually had a, a heated Reddit debate about this topic actually today. Um, I think I think I go with Dutch boy a bit. Uh, you know, the thing about the pro ladder is that it's you know the word pro is in it for professional, and it's you know it's for the people who really you know want to play this game. You know, really love this game, really want to go competitive. You know, and make it their career, as to say, right? Um, I think in some sense. It's working in that way. Uh, at least what we see is that what what seems to be the best players uh, are getting to the tournaments every time. Uh, you know, and I think even uh, qualifiers prove that. You know, with I, I remember Atsikov and Kolomon winning the first challenge qualifier. Uh, you know, Tailbolt winning winning another one. Like you know, it's the right. You know, it's the people who are the best of the game who are getting there. So in that sense, you know, I think it's really working. And to talk that uh, to talk back a bit about. Uh, the 100 game requirements um i think i think it's doing well in, in a sense uh because it's about you know it's also about the four factions the demo set you know you want the people who do consistently well you know you don't want people who peaked at a certain moment you know or like who peak with a certain faction to to get there you want people who are like a bit all around right like people who uh you know who have a consistent good win rate on everything you know which yeah normally proves that they're the good players and i think you know it's doing that right um i think you know there are some things that can be better and there should also be more for the other competitive players i think you know we have a lot of them in the team people who have a, have a job you know nine to five job and then come home and um you know and then play some you know kochua is one of them who recently won the the wild hunt uh too and i think you know for him it was great winning that because you know realistically he can never get top eight in pro ladder with the amount of time he has right. uh, and i think cdpr is doing a great job kind of shifting a little bit away from the grind allowing people to qualify in different ways and hopefully we'll see um a, a bit more of a move towards that as well i think it, giving giving a wider audience feel like letting them feel like there's a chance that um that they can make it too that anybody can get can qualify into the Gwent master system i think it's generally a good thing and, and will promote the popularity of the game yeah exactly all right let's uh move on to the final uh final pre-prepared viewer question as the managers of eratuza what do you think about the rise of other teams in the gwent scene Ooh, all right yeah, spicy question here. Uh, Heno, do you want to start off off with this one? Uh, yeah, you know, I I do. Um, I think I think it was first of interesting. You know, a lot of people said when Homecoming was announced that uh, you know Gwent is dead, and <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. nothing will happen. So I think you know a lot of people were surprised when a lot of teams came up. Uh, you know, to be honest, like I'm enjoying it. You know, it keeps us on our feet a bit, uh, and I love the friendly rivalries we have. Uh, you know, with CCG as an example. Uh, you know, um, we we kind of uh, go on and on already. Uh, they won, they won the Red Dragon event, you know, and they won the latest open. And we had uh, the other open win with Andy Wand, and we had uh, you know Kochua uh, winning the Wild Hunt, playing against their RK RK Fontes. That's a hard name to pronounce, but mm -hmm. I think I did right. Uh, you know, I really like the rivalry you have with those guys. Um, TLG is not team that's pretty new. I, they're they have more streamers, but uh, you know, I they had a lot of people coming into the challenge qualifiers, I believe. You know, so um, I think you know they're getting really into the qualifiers, trying there. Uh, you know, another team that we really like is Team Nova. We work a lot with them uh, on the content side. They uh, they do a lot of work on the meta snapshot. Um, you know, I think they have less competitive uh, aspirations, but more um, more of a um, content site although they did uh you know prepare nulf for the gwent open uh you know so i like the diversity of a lot of teams out there and also like new new teams coming up like uh there's actually there was a new russian team coming gwent dead hours they were called with house of cards i believe uh you know so i really like that uh, it keeps us on our feet cool demork has anything to add to that um uh, i really like it that there are uh, teams coming up it uh, may be uh leading to a whole new uh, tournament environment where uh, when the team become established, we can uh, make a big tournament and compete. And I think what we 
Uh, actually, one of the things we started off with Team Artusa was competing against other teams. Uh, like uh, first of all, it was a Brazilian, uh, not a Brazilian team necessary, but uh, like a team of uh, Brazilian uh, players. Then we played against Team Nova and uh, other uh, competitors. And also uh, Gwentify, 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 the Chinese team, and also, yeah. Sector uh, One. Sector One. Thing. Yeah, so we had <laughs> oh those, shit! We, had those, <laughs> we uh, forgot that one. <laughs> I, I know I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, we those show matches were always really enjoyable, and they uh, yeah. they were appreciated by a lot of people. So I think that's something that uh, will come up, will definitely come up, and uh, we are like other teams are eager to challenge us, and we are eager to show them who's uh, who's the boss here so <laughs> it's gonna be interesting and i'm looking forward to those matches and i think we can organize one definitely soon but um yeah i think that i yeah i like it that other people are stepping up i see that some people are elementary different to what our uh, approach what grow what uh to uh, what of no, let's let me rephrase to uh what our approach with the team was which mm -hmm. is cool because they may become totally different teams. And I wish uh, all of the new and recently founded people uh, good luck. And uh, I hope you um, yeah, find a good structure that works for you and you can develop competitively and content-wise because there will be a big demand after homecoming. And at last, I would like to give a shout out to Team Nova, obviously, because they have... Uh, we had a really great collaboration with them and that really shows that um, teams, they can not only compete with each other in a sportsmanship uh, manner, but also they can collaborate and uh, create great content like we do with Team Nova on the Meta Snapshot. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, we're going to move on to the um, the chat questions. Mark Theus, our wizard behind the curtains, has been noting down some of those questions from the chat. So... Let's uh, take a look at those. Watch Flake asks, uh, asks myself a question. When you were in Toronto, why didn't you meet me for a drink? Oh, Flake, you know the answer to that. <laughs> you, were, you were busy with a little something called Wild Hunt that weekend, but I'm sure we'll get uh, more opportunities in the future. I do have in-laws in Toronto, so next time I'm there, I will definitely hit you up. We'll have to hang out. Perfect. <laughs> Great. Uh, Impetuous Panda asks for Demorcus. Do you want to go to the hotel gym with me during Challenger? Yes, dude. Right. Like oh, if there is a hotel gym, let's see who can lift more, Panda. I'm definitely... Oh! Oh! oh challenge. <laughs> now we need tweets. We need proof. Down the I, I expect yeah. with, the, with the Challenger to be some kind of uh, fashion uh, fashion gym, like who can lift more barrels, who can carry, oh, who wow. can pull the <laughs> ship sick. further, <laughs> and, and such um, like Nordic challenges. So we can do that kind of thing need that <laughs> <laughs> all right last but not least bj the brave asks with rumors of the game switching to two rows are you concerned at all about the game losing its original identity from the original witcher 3 concept anybody want to uh, tackle that one hello do you want to take it yeah i think <laughs> um you know words might be a, a big word like uh, we do enjoy you know how the game is now in a sense uh you know people are always a bit scared of change aren't they um so it's I'm a bit you know a bit anxious I think to to what it will be because what we have now is good but you know I'm I'm hopeful that they test it enough and I'm pretty curious how it will be I love the witch tree Gwent but I mean there was a lot of broken stuff in there yeah, so, yeah. yeah. if you're concerned about think... you know, stats, if, if you're concerned about preserving the feel of original Witcher Gwent then you probably are worried that we don't have a zero point draw two card spies anymore. yeah Holy uh, but I, like for me personally I'm not worried about two rows at all I think two rows is the least of my concerns when it comes to homecoming changes um, two rows three rows as long as they balance effects like weather and last yeah. raid and you know igni and stuff like that then I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine i think with two rows and having some interesting effects for playing in one row or the other will increase the the complexity and the, the decision making during the game so i'm totally fine with two rows yeah i think it's definitely hard to like say that anything is bad or good without knowing the total picture it's just so hard to pinpoint that two rows is going to be awful when you don't know what any card is going to do compared mm -hmm. to those two rows. If you're going to make, if you're going to make Gwent uh, two rows right now with every card that's in the game, it's going to be horrible. But 
they're not planning to do that. So yeah. you just don't know yet. <laughs> All right. And I think uh, I think with that, we're going to wrap this show up. We've definitely gone longer than you. A lot of stuff to talk about. ton of fun talking with you guys, Heno and Demarcus. Really appreciate you guys joining us today. Thank you so much. And of course, Dutch Boy, my co-host. Great job today. Thank you so much, Dutch Boy. Thank you. And, too, uh, you're great. Next week, our, <laughs> next uh, next Grant talk will be in two weeks. It'll be episode six, hosted by a Pero and Green Cricket on August twentieth, uh, and we will take a sneak peek at Challenger number four, which will be like oh. a week or two from then. So be sure to tune in then. Check it out um, and join our public Eratusa Discord if you haven't yet to submit your questions for our guests. Our guests actually haven't are, are still yet to be determined, but um, we'll be talking about Challenger 4 will be the topic. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, have a great night, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye.